at Johns Hopkins. Um, she is also, and I suppose m very relevant to this talk, the director and founder in, um, of the Program in Museums and Society that's at Johns Hopkins as well. Um, and I um, don't want to take too much of her time to introduce her, but just to explain, I, mean, I think you have a really unique profile. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, I probably your interest unique in a good way, right? You, no, yes, unique in a, <laughs> yes, all, unique is always good, but um, unusual in that you really do span the museum world and the academic world, and you've done a lot of curating and a lot of teaching and teaching about the craft of exhibitions and thinking about exhibitions, and that's obviously something that we do here as well. And um, you, you are also. Elizabeth is also a research fellow here for the semester, so I'm hoping that this is the first of many opportunities for us to, to share and to learn about what you do and how you do it in your program. Um, I just want to mention a, a couple of your accomplishments before we delve into your talk. Um, so, and also just to say, you are a graduate of um, the University of Chicago, where you did a PhD with a dissertation on um, displaying relics of, um, of St. Mark and about relics in general in Venice. So that's your kind of official area. <laughs> and um, you have published a lot of articles and um, given lots of talks around that area and also in the, the field of museum studies and meanings of objects and the mobility of objects, um, which is the working group that you are part of now, which is a new thing, an AHRC um, funded research project um, in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And that is from what this talk comes out of. So look, I have all these post-its, but I, um, this is, as you can see, a voluminous and impressive CV. But I think probably we should just move ahead and just say that you um, are going to talk today about this project that comes out of your most most recent work. So Great. thank you, Elizabeth. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Deborah. Um, yeah, the thing binding these many things is distance, I think. So more about that to come. But thank you to you, um, to all the Bard Graduate Center faculty and staff and colleagues. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I was telling someone that my head was spinning already at the end of the first day here, but in a good way, good spinning. So um, I'm going to be speaking today about two things um, that are interrelated. The first and the bulk of my presentation, 95% of it, let's say, will be based on um, work that is coming out in an article momentarily. Uh, I think it's the February issue of Art History called Mobile Things on the Origins and Meanings of Levantine Objects in Early Modern Venice. And I'll be summarizing my core motivations, methods, and conclusions in that article. And then at the very end of the presentation, I'll be turning uh, to an introduction to my research project here at the BGC for the semester, which comes very directly out of some questions I posed in the Mobile Things article. And I'm really interested in getting your thoughts on the latter project especially, but of course happy to discuss all of the above. And my core question for this project, for the semester, is how could art museums better or more effectively present the migratory histories of objects? And what difference could this make in how we understand both objects and collections? So binding these things together and my work overall is our semester's theme, what is distance? And in many ways, my interest in distance differs from uh, that of um, <coughs> Mark Phillips, who presented on Monday and who is my office mate upstairs and the inspiration for our theme this semester. Um, Professor Phillips uses distance to think of really temporally about how we are <coughs> framing the past. Um, I'm really interested in spatial distance. I'm interested in a, a, a distance on the ground, so to speak. But I think we have things in common in that I'm also really interested in thinking about distance as something malleable, something conditional, and something that depends on relationships. Mark uh, Phillips uses the term redistancing with regard to historical work. And I have something of a similar attitude toward spatial distance, which I want to see less as the measure of a landscape, really a, a geographical frame or a map between points, 
and more in terms of relationships spanning space or made through its spanning. So relational, much as we were discussing on Monday at our lunch. Um, and more specifically, I'm really interested in movement across distance rather than distance itself or the poles that make and mark distance. So James Clifford, uh, whom you all probably know, speaks of paths rather than maps, of trajectories over a fixed scheme, and he favors roots, R-O-U-T-E-S, over roots, R-O-O-T-S. I don't know if my Midwestern accent clarifies the distinction there, but I find it a helpful distinction as well. Um, and to put it in a phrase, I'm really concerned with how attention to the literal spanning of distance, the movement of things across space, is or could be more actively a part of our approach to interpreting objects. So let's start with the Mobile Things Research Project. Um, the matter that prompted this article, or the matters, are twofold. Um, one uh, is a group of objects in the sphere of Venice around 1500. I'm really looking at the 16th century, let's say, a very long 1500, that occupy um, an interim space, let's say. That is, that were not clearly products of one place or another, but lie somewhere in between. Because either they're composites, or they are of unknown origin, or maybe because that in-between space between where something was produced and where at some point it ended up is particularly meaningful. And one example is this cup at the Victoria and Albert Museum, the so-called Priuli wine cup. Uh, the other thing that really prompted my thinking were museum installations, and especially permanent collections, in which geography, a geographical layout, continues to be the predominant working scheme, even when it complicates, or maybe it obfuscates, or refuses to help us really unpack some of the objects it contains. So here's the same object, um, with, which sits, by the way, in the European galleries of the VNA, which is an interesting choice and its online catalog description, which reads that it was made in Syria, possibly made, Damascus, Syria, probably decorated, Egypt, possibly made, <laughs> and then goes on and speculates the cup was likely fabricated in the Middle East, the foot in Venice, and the whole sent to Syria for decoration in a single workshop. So you'll note uh, many places of production associated with this single object, and even then, uh, a lack of certainty, be up, certainty about where it came from with all these possibly and probablys. So this and objects like it captured my ima imagination um, for a few reasons. One, uh, I felt frustrated. I felt that the conversation around these sorts of objects in scholarship and also in some museum exhibitions was really so insistently on point of production uh, even to its own detriment, even when it seemed there would be no resolution. And by these, in this case, I'm talking about objects like this damascened metalwork, which is incised brass or bronze inlaid with precious metal, usually silver. Sometimes these objects are called Veneto Saracenic, itself a term that suggests how complicated this issue of origins is. So I found that these objects were getting caught in a circular vo vortex of sort of geolocation, let's say. Is it Venetian or is it Levantine? As though if we couldn't say where it was produced, um, maybe there were no more questions to ask. Um, I found in my reading that material studies, close examination and even analysis, are possibly some really productive ways of beginning to answer some of these questions. Uh, in the meantime, I wondered what other questions we could ask about objects like these. Other questions that might be more revealing, historically speaking, or that might be actually revealed by this dilemma itself. The other thing that was interesting for me was that the market for these sorts of objects in Venice in the late 15th and into the 16th century was really complicated. So you had Venetian buyers um, impacting forms that were produced in the Levant, such as the flat-lidded box you see at the bottom. These are all out of scale. I apologize for that. Um, so, so there's an influence from Venice onto the production of these things in, in the Levant. Eventually, as Rosamund Mack and others have shown, Venice started imitating these Levantine wares. So the object at top is a salver. It's in the Courtauld Museum, attributed to Venice in the 16th century. Um, and in addition, we have hybrid pieces like the Priuli cup here now at upper right um, and others of unknown origin. So to me, this circumstance raises a host of interesting questions that offer an alternative to the where it was made 
line of inquiry, such as how successful were the Venetian imitations of Levantine objects? Did consumers in Venice distinguish between imports and locally made objects? Could they distinguish? And if so, did they value them differently from imports? How can we, can we um, know this? Uh, just a, a brief remark um, to say that this question encompasses lots of other kinds of objects. I'm focusing on a few categories for brevity today, but things like carpets, uh, porcelain, book bindings, for example. Um, so the general question really is, how can we better understand what these Levantine or Levantinizing objects meant to Ven Venetians in and around 1500? What frames of reference best represent the contemporary notions of the relationships between objects, people, and places? Um, to answer this question, or address this question, uh, I leveraged a few tools, which I'm going to talk about now. Um, first of all, I, I borrowed, somewhat liberally, from the field of archaeology, the term provenience. Um, in archaeology, this refers, refers to a find site, a literal place in the ground. And I employ it uh, to indicate something very specific, and that is where something was produced, or its literal geographical point of origin, acknowledging, as we saw with the Priuli cup, that there, there could be multiple points of origin. But this precision is important uh, to me because, first of all, I really want to distinguish point of production from more conceptual relationships to location and to space, something I'll get to in a, in a bit, and um, also because of its fixity. In its fixity, it contrasts with a notion like provenance, uh, a, a concept we're all familiar with that really embodies in its very concept <coughs> the notion of post-production movement. So by insisting on this differentiation and, and sort of borrowing or coining this term provenience, I can more firmly underscore the important distinction between a point or points of origin fixed on a map and the afterlife of an object which almost always involves circulation and movement. Uh, another frame for my thinking was really to think about the limitations of mapping. Um, art history, as we know, has long been tied to a geographical frame, thanks just to Vasari framing things by regional schools. And art museums since the end of the 18th century really have been similarly guided by geography, so laid out according to region, according to nation, nations, and you can look at the Louvre by way of uh, beginning that conversation. And I know this group well knows the connection between um, the origins and developments of the art museum and of nation states in the 19th century. Um, so we have museums set up according to nationalist concerns that don't reflect the historical imaginings associated with the objects they contain necessarily. And that thus, in that sort of fixed framing, according to the map, erase some of the fluidity of these objects, whether they be hybrid objects or dislocated objects. For Benedict Anderson, for whom museums were one of the tools of control or the grid for the colonial state, quote, the effect of the grid was always to be able to say of anything that it was this, not that, that it belonged here, not there. On the other hand, uh, and like James Clifford, I want to think about roots, movement over roots, permanence or fixity, displacement, um, movement over stasis. And to see, as Clifford puts it, practices of displacement as constitutive of cultural meanings. So how can we access an alternative to a static museological or art historical map of origins? We need tools that allow us to understand spatial relationships of things in more historically pertinent ways than the modern museum does. And for this, I turn to the work of Craig Clunas, who is a brilliant scholar, uh, curator of late Ming China. Um, specifically, his book, Superfluous Things, and a chapter within it called Words About Things, in which he looks at contemporary Ming texts to get a sense of the frames of reference of Ming area viewers, their language. What did they look at? What did they focus on? How did they group things? How did they talk about things? So I tried to do the same, looking at Venetian texts of around 1500 that deal with things to uncover contemporary understandings of the relationships between things and space. 
and in this way to offer an alternative to the static museum model based on those 19th century maps of national boundaries. These texts fall into categories that you can see uh, on the slide here, related specifically to trade, collections, history writing, which largely took the form of chronicles in Venice at this time, and, and travel writing. Um, and I'll just give you a few examples um, for today. So words related to trade. There are remarkably, to my mind, remarkably few references to provenience, to use that word, or point of production in the documents that I looked at. And um, what I did was survey uh, historical texts that were looking themselves at these primary source documents. So looked, I looked at mercantile histories. Um, so for example, um, cargo ship inventories tend to be highly general, very inconsistent in their references to merchandise and economic historians basically agree that it's essentially impossible to trace cargo loads to particular places of production, to an original source. Um, customs logs and records for things like wood, olive oil, and spices concentrate likewise on point of purchase and point of export, but not point of, let's say, harvest for these sorts of goods. And I found you know, similar sorts of things when I was looking at uh, the, the objects that interest me, for example, carpets known as rodioti carpets, which suggests they came from Rhodes, um, but evidence is Rhodes was not producing carpets. Rhodes was a shipping point, so marked in a term by where it came out of, but not where it was made, not its provenience. Um, exceptions can be found uh, in taxation rolls, um, where provenience sometimes was a reason for higher taxes. Uh, levied by the Cinque Savi alla Mercanzia, which was sort of like the Venetian Board of Trade. So cotton from Syria or Palestine deemed to be of better quality, cost more, was thus taxed higher. Um, likewise, there are textiles categorized in these records by origin to determine proper taxation. But this is quite rare. There aren't many references of this sort. And I would also say it expresses a sort of defensive posture about origins rather than a connoisseurial one. So I think it's important to underscore that not all interest in origins or provenience is equal or museum-like. Um, and I'll come back to this idea in a bit. So also I looked at words related to collections. Um, for example, Marcantonio Michiel's collection notes from the 1520s and 30s. He's intensely focused on, um, in his abbreviated style, but nevertheless, materials, makers, subjects, and locations within collections, which interestingly he sort of treats as maps. He moves through a collection space as though it were a map, sort of geographically. Um, he pays some attention to condition of things and to scale of things, but basically doesn't talk about origins of objects at all. Um, for example, in his discussion of Andrea Odoni's collection, he makes a few comments, maybe two, to previous owners and one to a workshop. Um, I also looked at other sorts of documents, and for example, the will of Gabriele Vendramin from 1548. Now, wills are very abbreviated genres, but even so, uh, Vendramin is really quite specific in uh, his attention to materials, for example. So he contrasts where he categorizes things, whether they be copper, bronze, brass, and Corinthian brass, or br I'm sorry, Corinthian bronze, which is really quite precise. He gives some attention to monetary value, to workmanship, to age, but he does not talk about sources. Uh, he does worry a lot about where his collection will go, <laughs> and it is a will after all, um, but not about where it came from. Um, Lastly, uh, for today, words in chronicles. And here I'm going to focus on Francesco Sansovino's Venezia Città Nobilissima from 1581. Again, my long circa 1500. But this chronicle is heavily based on uh, Marino Sanudo's diaries from just around 1500. And in scanning Sansovino, who is incredibly detailed in his description of the city, uh, I found um, he basically concentrates on four categories for describing objects. And in one point, he actually isolates these. And those four categories or concerns are antiquity or age, uh, craftsmanship, materials, and rarity. He really doesn't discuss where things came from at all that I could tell. 
Um, so not, I would say origin, not a category that interested him. And I don't have time to speak about travel narratives today, but I found a similar set of interests in those texts. So I want to make really clear that I'm not arguing that Venetians did not care about or didn't think about where things came from. I mean, they were deeply embedded in trade. So I think they were interested in origins of objects. But I do think it means we need to rethink our understanding of the forms that interest took and not elide it with or limit it to our own museological or historical frames of where it was made. Um, and here, then, are some of my proposals of how we might do that. So, or what to do with these words now that we have isolated them. So I think we need to reconsider the so-called metadata, the words attached to things. And here I'm borrowing a term that um, Christopher Wood uses in a um, round table on the global before globalization, when he indicates that most objects of this period did not travel with the, quote, metadata of production. That is, who made them, when, where. Uh, notably, actually, that's the sort of stuff typically on the museum label, right? Um, and, and Wood says objects were confronted as they were. Um, so in that case, I might, thinking back to um, Sansovino and the categories of interest, we might think objects were understood based on what could be seen about them, their materials and their form and craftsmanship, let's say, two of those categories. Now, in my article, I don't have time to do this here, but I investigate what this this set of interests might mean in a mercantile society uh, with a strong culture of visual comparison. So I'm really interested in this idea of comparison. Paragone is how you know it through art history. Uh, Venetian markets that actually had comparison days, giorni da parangon in Venetian dialect, where you would go and look at things side by side and compare, and compare them. And also interesting that Sometimes the, the idea of describing is characterized through the very act of making relationships, comparing and contrasting, dar similitudine. But what, you know, so what did the metadata of this period look like? Where did it come from? Um, and one way we can begin to think about this is to think about how words do reference place. Um, it's widely recognized in m much scholarship of these objects that geographic terminology does not in any way consistently point to place of production. And there are many examples of this I could cite. So uh, tapedo turquesco, for example, Turkish carpet really is a, just a generic term for a, a tar carpet that looks that way in some sense. Um, Elizabeth Curry notes that by the 16th century, Textiles uh, known as Perpignano, Ormesino, and Tabi really referred to types of textiles and not specific origins in the respective cities they named, Perpignan, Ormuz, and the Atabi district of Baghdad. Um, the term Damaskino, the Damascan, Damaskino is really complicated. Um, for metalwork, it seems to point to the home of that art where it was most famously known, Damascus, but in other places, it clearly seems to reference style. So there are carpets known as tapeti uh, damaschini, and Kurt Erdmann tells us, well, this is much more likely related to the types of knots that were used in these carpets that produced a certain sort of shimmery surface that was characteristic of carpets produced in Egypt. Um, for porcelain, porcellana alla damaschina, likewise, probably refers to the meandering pattern on the porcelain that recalls the Damascene metalwork. So if these sorts of words can't bind an object to a specific place of production, to a provenience, uh, what can they tell us about the relationships of things to space and place? And I think we can begin to think about this by looking back at those four categories of value that did seem to carry significant weight for the interpretation of things in 16th century Venice, that is, antiquity or age, craftsmanship, materials, and rarity. So I proposed um, that perhaps the lure of an imported object was the lure of fine craftsmanship. You know, if the Turks were reputed to make the best rugs, you want one of those. This is a general sense of origin, but I wouldn't call it a provenience or geolocated or mapped to a place. It's much more elusive in its relationship to place. And the best example I can think of from our own moment is what we mean when we say made in China. Well, 
We might mean it's made in China, and we might, if we're really knowledgeable, mean a specific place in China. But we might more likely be thinking of the quality of the good, or what it's made out of, or how long it will last. So we have a whole other set of meanings that we might attach to that apparently provenience-based phrase. Um, so craftsmanship. Um, perhaps these notions of place are linked to this really prominent and, and, and thick understanding of the idea of rarity. So things that come from far away uh, tend to be more rare, right? They endure risk as they move across space. They accrue costs through this movement. Um, I, one of the works that I had the chance to read just in the past couple of weeks, which is a great example of how being here is enriching my thinking already, is um, uh, Jennifer Roberts' book on 19th century American art called Transporting Visions, in which she really um, explores this idea that transport of objects plays onto these objects in significant ways. And I'll just quote her very briefly. She says, distances and delays were not merely passive intermissions or negative spaces between active sites of production, but constitutive of meaning. And I really want to try thinking more like Jennifer Roberts does uh, in my future work. Uh, interestingly, in some cases, things that came from far away were very familiar. Um, and the best example of that uh, are carpets. Uh, and this slide, maybe not the best example I could have chosen, but you could see in the upper register women sitting at windows with carpets unfurled in front of them. And this is a, a common motif in the visual representations of Venice of this period. So you see that carpets were abundant and highly visible. They were very known, even if they came from far away. And likewise, the lexicon used to talk about carpets is very rich, which speaks of a broad familiarity, a, a broad spectrum of understanding and acquaintance with these things. So these terms often do connote different places. We've already encountered Turcheschi, Damaschini, Rodioti, but there are also terms like Kajarini, referring to Cairo in Egypt, Barbareschi, referring to North Africa, uh, and Sinikaza, probably Circassian on the Black Sea. My point is that this language of distance is very much a language of familiarity. So there's this spectrum of spatial meanings in which the relationship of objects to space or distance was both practical and conceptual, particularly within a mercantile context, that it was flexible rather than absolute, and that it was far more complicated than pinning something uh, to a place on a map of origins. I think, um, in short, we need to decouple the exotic, and this is a term I have avoided, <laughs> um, because of how it binds objects too closely to a distant place. I want to decouple uh, these sorts of objects from a point on a map and recognize more fluid relationships between place of origin and material significance. Um, to quote Michel de Certeau, memory is a sort of anti-museum. It is not localizable. So what to do with words? I just want to um, toggle back to my previous slide for a moment. Um, and the final point there. Uh, these observations also invite us to rethink classification, both historical and modern, that is, museological. And now I'm beginning to move into the, the last part of my talk. Um, if we focus our discussion of classification back on these kinds of objects, that is, damascene ware, just to remind you, we find this material in various contexts in 16th century Venice. So we find it, for example, in sort of Wunderkammern-like uh, contexts in which uh, it, it resonates as a curiosity. We find it among inventories of affluent households where it registers as a, a domestic good, a high-end, and also more kind of work-a-day. Um, and we also find it, interestingly, in collections. And I'm just starting to work on an inventory of 1527 that, to me, really suggests a sort of proto scientific categorization of these sorts of objects. So uh, I hope to have more to say about that. But in any event, the fact that these objects slip between these categories means they don't sit firmly in any one uh, that, that can frame them absolutely. Um, likewise, the categories that we find in museums don't really work either. I don't <coughs> need to really uh, say much about minor arts or decorative arts, I think, but we know those are not historically apt. 
Um, luxury goods is more tricky. That's a category we sometimes see being used, applied to these sorts of things. It's not really a category of use in this period. There certainly are luxuries, lucy, pompe, magistrato alle pompe. This is a, luxury is absolutely a concept, um, but I would argue that it's not necessarily a category of good. I think it's more a category of use. Um, objects become luxuries when they're, you have too many of them or they're too big or you're too showy with them. Uh, so more a category of use than a category of a thing. And the only word that I have found consistently used to describe the objects I'm considering, that I might consider a category into which they fit, is the term mobili, which means mobile things. Now, um, importantly, this is not limited to imports, things ca that came from overseas. And so it breaks down right there our desire to want to separate things from there and things from here. It mixes them up. Um, it, it, um, it stands in contrast instead to immobili, things that don't move. And these terms are still used in Italian today to indicate mobili furnishings and immobili real estate. Um, so I, I really want to grab onto this term and think about it more for a few reasons. One, I think it's historically appropriate. You see it all the time in wills and inventories, heading categories of objects. Um, and it also speaks to um, a Venetian identity that's lodged in circulating things, in trade, in moving things around, as opposed to a land-based economy. Um, it also pushes up nicely for me against museological categories of things and unsettles them. It seems like a huge category. It seems to embrace everything. But it was the category of choice, I would say, for 16th century Venetians talking about things like this, if they wanted to envelop them in one label. Um, it also calls attention to this often forgotten element of such things, that they move. And so it invites us to make that factor more prominent and more important in how we think about these objects. And then I, I'm taken back to Jennifer Roberts' work again. And by us, I mean art historians, and I also mean museums. I think this term could invite museums to dislodge objects from those geographical homes that are traditional to the museum and comfortable to the museum and call more attention to displacement and <coughs> circulation, uh, in short, to the, the mobility of things themselves. So this is a challenge I pose at the end of this art history paper, and it's um, the root of my project, this term. And I think it matters for a few reasons, and here I'm really moving into my last points. Um, first of all, I think mobility reveals the complexity of objects and breaks down those essentialist notions of culture that reify connections to place and particularly to nation. Uh, and in this context, I think it can help do the same for collections and museums themselves, revealing something of their origins, why they are here, and in this sense helping us attend to uh, everything from colonial histories to current issues around repatriation. I think notably and importantly, the one thing, really the only thing that museum objects share, except for site-specific works, is that they came there from somewhere else. Um, they're mobile. And here's James Clifford then one more time. The rethinking of collections and displays as unfinished historical processes of travel, of crossing and recrossing, changes one's conception of patrimony and public. What would be different if major regional or national museums loosened their sense of centrality and saw themselves as specific places of transit? What does it mean to work within these entanglements <coughs> rather than striving to transcend them? Uh, so um, this semester I'm putting this query uh, to art museums, namely how might they more effectively display, investigate, and make sense of the mobility of things? And to conclude, then, I'm just going to share with you a few ideas that I'm <coughs> pursuing, and I welcome your thoughts on this, certainly today and in the months to come, uh, as well as response to the, the core of my paper. Um, I think one way to think about mobility in the museum is surely to use digital initiatives. Uh, digital methods are great for layering more information on to collections without mussing up the galleries, and they also have an inherently uh, an inherent potential for animating things. So I did a project at the Walters Art Museum with Ben Tillman in which we used Google Earth to show the circulation of objects around the globe. That's 10-year-old technology. I'm hoping there might be something um, 
sleeker one could use today. And I'm actually very interested and want to look more into things that have been done here, like the Objects of Exchange project with its tag cloud that seems to reconfigure networks, uh, which I find really interesting. There are a lot of exhibitions and temporary installations that provide good food for thought. The interwoven globe at the Met was really about, yeah, objects that were produced um, for trade and thus really benefit from being thought about in those uh, intersecting ways. Um, Encompassing the Globe, a show about a decade ago, I believe, at the first Sackler, was about Portugal and its trading economy. And it, to my recollection, this is something I need to research more, really literally put Portugal at the center and then sort of arranged the exhibition as a sort of compass rose. So an alternative kind of mapping that tried to visualize those relationships. And upcoming at the Smithsonian at the Museum for African Art, coming from the Craner at the University of Illinois, is this exhibition, World on the Horizon, um, uh, about the arts of the Swahili coast. And it looks at, and now I'm quoting the, the exhibition description, objects that visualize networks of mobility and encounter. So again, really, it's really putting that question front and center. Um, and I would also like to point to the John Lockwood Kipling show that just closed here. That was an exhibition about a person who moved, but I think that's another way of kind of facilitating this understanding of mobility of things. I think it's a challenge for permanent collections. I'm not suggesting museums should all become, you know, de-geographied, uh, if that's a word. But um, I think maybe permanent collections can learn from these things. We've, the Met has a nice case of export where there are ways in which interventions are being done, but I think these special exhibitions might help museums think harder about these issues. A third thing I, I need to do, and here I could really use help from some of my colleagues here, is close looking at individual objects that might tell these stories on their surfaces. I'm interested in these sort of Veneto Levantine things that may have passed through Venice, but I'm also broadly interested in objects that would really tell this story to the eye. I think artistic artist interventions is a potentially very powerful way of thinking about these sorts of things. The theater of disappearance on the Met rooftop last summer took objects from around the museum and sort of made these chimera-like figures that was not exactly addressing my concern, but was a way of disrupting objects in their place. I'm actually very interested in this exhibition by Maria Teresa Alves, or this installation, Seeds of Change, which she called a ballast flora garden. She planted the seeds that had come or were of the type that had come on ships to Bristol. So she made a garden that was sort of about plants that had moved. So I think artists might help us see these issues in different ways. And lastly, I think art museums could look more productively and carefully at other kinds of museums, ethnographic museums, which have really had to think critically about the origins of their own collections, uh, history museums in which objects have such a tight connection to where they were made and why uh, that art museums are able to you know, obfuscate at, at times. Botanical collections, I've already acknowledged, the New York Botanic Garden has an installation right now, Saving the Plants of the World, on traveling scientists who have brought plants back to New York. So I'm curious to see how they've talked about that. And then I even thought, what about um, installations of human migration? Because a lot of the theory I've been reading is really about the migration of people. So I don't know if that could be a productive mm -hmm. place of looking as well. Are those sorts of things transferable? So I'll end by restating the second part of my research question, which is, what difference would museological <coughs> attention to mobility make in how we understand objects and collections? And I'm only starting to dig into this, but again, I welcome your responses. So, Great. thank you. Thank you so much. It was the perfect length um, and <laughs> has given us lots of food for thought. Um, so let's, let's open the floor. Jeffrey. Um, Elizabeth, I, just, I was calculating the other day how long I've known you, and I think it was literally like 25 years ago that we got to know each other. Yes, Venice, possibly. So it's, it's Could be in Venice. See, Here we it's are. It's great to see Venice still. <laughs> I just wanted to say two things. I'm very excited by this work. I, I'm so glad you're here. It seems very central to a lot of things we're thinking about at the Park Garden Center. And just two, two kind of threads I wanted to highlight. <clears throat> Since you've used the word mobility and, and that, you know, in your title and as a conceptual thing for this project, and you're, you're highlighting the, you know, the occurrence of that word in the, in the contemporary documents as a meaningful category, I think that would be really great that I mean, maybe you've done this, but I think it would be really great to 
try to individuate, you know, to what extent that is specific to this mercantile trading culture that you're seeing in Venice, mm -hmm. because my sense is that it's not actually, mm -hmm. and that it's a legal term that mm -hmm. comes from much older Latin juridical language like mobiles res or bona mobilia, you know, that, that actually have a, you know, an antique precedent and, um, I mean, in French, it's meuble, and I, right. I know that as an adjective, like, like there are 13th century probate inventories or, or wills and things in, in France, which, you know, is not the same culture as the right. right. 16th, Venice circa 1500 that are talking about, you know, bien meuble. Right. And that did eventually kind of get corrupted into the mm -hmm. current meaning of furniture or furnishings. But mm -hmm. it, I think it was used in a, in a so it would be important to parse those documents and yeah. see w what does that term mobile mean for them? Are they actually thinking about mobility across the globe, or are, is, are they simply playing to mm -hmm. that, those yes. types of things that are, need to be treated in a certain way legally and economically? And then my second just thought is I'm really glad you highlighted the, you know, the, the ways that museums and curators are thinking about how to show this. And I would add to your list uh, a long roster of BGC exhibitions, mm -hmm. like Margarita von Varek, you mm -hmm. know, which is the obvious one that Deborah and Peter did, mm -hmm. you know, about, about reassembling objects from across the globe, but their interest was how they ended up in, you know, Long Island in the 1690s. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or, I don't know, one could think of the Fragile Diplomacy exhibition mm -hmm. that we did here, where, yes, they were mice and products, but what was interesting about them was how they moved and where they ended up. Mm -hmm. um, in, in approaches last term, um, you know, Deborah and I tried to do a, a unit, um, I think we called it Objects in Motion or something like that, and we were trying to wrestle with what, what frameworks do you use when, mo when what is most interesting about an object is not the moment of production, but it's mm -hmm. the moment of later movement, reception, valuation, something in some way that involves, you know, the market collecting, museums, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just thinking that a, another Another context in which museums are wrestling with objects that don't, or, or that could potentially be shown in many regional galleries or even many chronological galleries is something like, you know, grand tour objects. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of places like the Getty, which I think actually have been really in the forefront of creating galleries um, where in one room, you know, you have antiquities, mm -hmm. heavily restored antiquities. Mm -hmm. things made in an ancient style, and they're all together, because what's important about them is the culture that valued things in that way and saw that aspect of, of things. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's actually, it is doing what you're recommending in a permanent installation, mm -hmm. it's kind of. So doesn't the Ashmolean have a yes, brand? Yes, yeah. many, many, yeah. many, I was just most recently here. there, but yes, yeah. that, that, I'm just trying to think, that's one rubric under which people have been forced to say, well, maybe this actually would be more meaningful to visitors if it's not in the ancient gallery, that's right. but if it's in the 18th right. century gallery or a branch of the sculpture gallery that's about taste, not, right. so anyway, just right. Right. Thoughts. No, no, those are great yeah, talks. Great, um, great talk. Thank no, you. thank you very much. Um, uh, just a couple responses. Um, the Ashmolean I'm interested in, because I believe the Ashmolean actually, and I think Andrew and I were talking about this, uh, reinstalled, yeah, um, reinstalled their whole collection around a sort of yeah. theme of, <coughs> I don't know, you said Wunderkammern, but I'm wondering well, if that's that what. The, that was the beginnings of it. Yeah, the and then sort of curious. the process of assemblage, basically. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they're moving away from that, so I, I feel like I need to hang on to it. But thank you for the suggestions for other things to look at. Um, I think maybe I'll work backwards in my response. My first response would be, I, I think those are all great suggestions. Where I'm trying to, and it's, it's sort of a subtle nuance, but how do you show, you can show that something arrived. It's kind of that intervening time, how this conception of that, and I think that's hard. We know that that statue ended up there. It was, and maybe it's something that just can't be put in a museum. I don't know. but. There's something slightly different between saying this got here and influenced that, and and the Grand Tour is a good example because I think you really are talking about the, the and again associated with migration of people. So, mm -hmm. but it's sort of that movement itself. As to the term mobility, fully and mo mobile, I fully take your point, and the fact that it's still used today. And, and I'm not claiming that this is some unique Venetian term, but really, what does it mean in that context, and and how does it help us? Just attending to the fact that these how th are how things were talked about underscores a certain kind of valuing of them. I think it would be interesting to see 
how it, it plays out in other contexts. I expect I might find much the same, but does that mean it has the same value? You know, the, the use of words is also specific to the moment. So I think, but I think that's an important point. So thank you. Great. Um, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. I think this uh, talk was really important, uh, especially in this, uh, from the point of view of reminding me that these are some of the issues which I have also encountered in um, my previous research or handling objects, uh, and probably I wasn't able to articulate it as well as you did today. Um, something that uh, I was thinking about and is something I wish to ask you if you have any thoughts on it are, uh, is that, um, what do you think, do you think it would be effective, uh, for instance, to have um, dis or say display objects in such a way that they, uh, that, that or maybe categorize them um, from the point of view of their distribution routes in the sense, you know, how have they traveled globally? Do you think that's manageable in terms of how we categorize objects in a particular collection in a museum, or do you think that's just impractical? And I don't know. I mean, I, and I also don't know if it's, you know, museums always have to think about what's interesting to visitors, too, is it just right. technical? Um, so um, Ruth Phillips actually directed me to a, a really interesting book by Chris Gosden, I think, in which he looks at, maybe someone knows the name of it, he looks at the history of the building of the Pitt Rivers collection and he takes it back through documents. And um, it, it's interesting because to me it's a fascinating book because he's really talking in many ways about exactly what I'm interested in, really focusing on that kind of transition between places. And it makes a fascinating book, but I, I looked on their, their visualization of it and it, it, it doesn't really work. So I, I don't know, I, I think, I think there could be digital ways of visualizing this that would be really effective. I'm not so sure, you know, you can sort of do a network kind of display. Um, but that's, the, I'm, I'm really looking for the effectiveness. So something beyond sort of, oh, this came here and went there, but really something, an installation that tries to right. emphasize that whole network and the continuity. Mm -hmm. I'll let you know if I find some good examples. <laughs> But I do. I, I tend toward to think that digital tools might be the, the way to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a number of questions here. I'll start with Abby, and then Jesse, and then Peter. Thank you so much. This is just such a cool project, and it dovetails with the type of questions that I'm working on too. It's really, really exciting. Um, and one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about, and I'm sure you have too, that you didn't talk so much about it today, is what using objects or collecting objects that are clearly um, objects that have moved through space accomplishes for the person who mm -hmm. consumes, for the consumer, for the collector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I was thinking while looking at your wine cup is what does something that is explicitly visually hybrid, that is, I hate the word hybrid, yeah. using, it here, <laughs> using it here as a sort of, sort of shorthand, uh -huh. that clearly has um, production that spans multiple points or that brings together different kinds of elements does that show a kind of virtuosic command of distance, of wealth? Is, is there something that makes this more valuable to the consumer than something that could just be imported? Um, and I'm thinking, uh, in my own work, there's, there's, a, there's a minbar that is produced um, out of materials taken from sub-Saharan Africa in Toledo and then brought back to North Africa. And that object could only be produced by moving materials across vast distances and then moving the finished materials back across vast distances. That is, it demonstrates the political reach of the patrons mm -hmm. and their <coughs> wealth and their power. So looking at this, is this doing the same thing? Is there something about this that shows, hey, I can take something from far away, bring it here, modify it, and then send it back to far away to be Mm -hmm. Finish. I don't know. It's interesting. I participated in a conference. It's a great question. Thank you. I look forward to talking to you more about your examples. Um, I participated in a conference in Venice about maybe a couple of years ago that was um, on mark. Oh, I can't remember the term that was used, but it was essentially how Venice marketed itself. Mm -hmm. Venetian craftsmen, and 
I made the argument that one of the things the Venetians did was imitate, and that that was a sort of Venetian kind of in itself, we were desperately avoiding the word grand, but sort of a, a, a quality of work that was produced here is that it, it was able to look like something else. It was chameleon-like. Mm -hmm. So I haven't really thought about it from a collecting point of view, and I'm not sure I could get at it, but I have thought a bit, of, a bit about it from a making point of view, and I think that was a skill that was appreciated among craftspeople. So from a production sense, mm -hmm. I think there's an alliance there with the sorts of things you're thinking about. And you know, the, the, the texts about collecting are so thin in the language that I would have to sort of begin to refilter some of those um, words that I went through to see if I could find evidence of that kind of sensibility, which might be worth doing. I think mm -hmm. it's a good thought. And the Thank question you. is whether the hybridity is visible, and we see it, right. but would exactly. it have been, and that, would, would any of that have been visible to someone well, who's thinking it? I mean, they're definitely, I'm thinking of some of those some Medici are, right. cups that have you know, rock crystal, and then sure. they have the niche. I mean, they're, they're also very much right. made at different times and places, and that's the point of them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's not my turn. Yeah, um, no, no, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't resist. Um, Jessica? Yeah. yeah, I was uh, thinking of, um, a lot about the correlations between this idea of, and it's a term by Bruce Sterling, uh, the, it's called spines, which are objects that are tracked through space and time. Mm -hmm. It's related to this idea of all objects being now traceable and even objects communicating with one another. But at the base, the idea is that, and especially with Abby's question, looking at um, modes of production and movement through time and space really helps us get an idea of not only the object, but the people who are moving them. Mm -hmm. and we, which he calls spine anglers. <laughs> really, uh, Speaking about term. words. That's so uh, it, that's interesting. You were talking about movement of objects. And I was thinking of uh, nomadology and mm -hmm. just how things are moved and, um, mm -hmm. through space and time and who moves them. So I am really interested in those concepts, but I'm interested in how you take that. So. And so Bruce Sterling is working on what kinds of materials specifically? Or? I think it was general. I read an article based on his theory, which was looking at the production of even milk from cows to grocery stores and how you can look at uh, points of disruption through tracking objects and how they're tracked. But I mean, applying those same theories uh, uh, kind of in a yeah, that's very interesting. Well, I mean, since you mentioned, I think food is a major category where this happens. Yes. And in a lot of um, work I've done on, on 16th century Venetian food books, uh, in fact, um, the, the, the placeness is something that's either, uh, it's usually not real, but it's something that's very important in the, describing the quality of, of a dish. Mm -hmm. And it probably has nothing to do with where it actually comes from, but it's constitutive of ingredients sometimes or process. So that's a whole mm -hmm. topic. But that's, that's interesting because it sounds very yeah. much like it mirrors what I was observing, which is that you know that the place is really about the, the, the worksmanship, the craftsmanship, how it's produced, right. or the you know something more material. Um, so that sounds like it actually kind of mirrors. Yeah. But anyway, that's interesting. I'm also interested in this convergence of space and time. Mm -hmm. I think thinking about distance in that way. I don't know that I like the word spine, but um, <laughs> 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 yeah, there's a lot of so the, the, the talked about was, was authenticity also, mm -hmm. which is really important mm -hmm. and to, uh, to, to establish that something really does come from a place or not and how important that was. And I know that's a whole other Right, and category. so this gets to what Jeffrey yeah. just said too. Could people tell? And that's something yeah. I, I don't talk about and I, <laughs> in the article, I basically say we don't know, and I'm not going to talk about that <laughs> because I just I just don't know how we know if they could tell. I mean, maybe some way else. And, and and I have to say, you know, people have, there are there's I think more confidence in where things like this come. We're getting better in our connoisseurial skills, I think, than we were. Um, but my point is sort of is that the only thing we can ask about these objects? Um, okay, so who's next? Oh, Peter, and then okay, then all right. So let's just like yeah. We have a couple more minutes. So Elizabeth, I'm, 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 it was a lovely uh, presentation. I'm very sympathetic. I, uh, here's the question. So the, the penultimate slide of yours was voiced over with uh, the desire to kind of uh, upend or disquiet some of the conventional categories that are used and to reshift them a little bit. But it strikes me 
that the sources, at least the literary ones you were using to do the unsettling, were themselves pretty settled, reified categories of their own. I'm thinking of the inventory of Benjamin or mm -hmm. Sanudo or Sansovino. These are pretty, pretty basic, well-known things. And yet, at the beginning, you did make the point that these things came to Venice through the agency of merchants. Mm -hmm. um, and so it struck me that actually, you know, in addition to the public printed sources, mm -hmm. there are all of the letters of merchants mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would, first of all, letters are entirely different kettle yeah. of fish. They'll tell mm -hmm. you all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, the conventions and terrariums are very different. Um, and at the same time, you know, the kind of the metadata, to use Chris's term, mm -hmm. the metadata would be in those letters. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff on merchant letters that's been published, uh, you know, in the last 10 years. So I, I, I know really only uh, about Marseille in the 17th century, mm -hmm. but I suspect that there must be a lot of unpublished merchant letters that could get you very close to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. That's a, a really helpful suggestion. I, yes, I mean, when I, my first hope was that in looking at, in being a really radical art historian and looking at, you know, shipping documents of cargo, uh, that I would come across this great way of understanding how these things were grouped on ships and that this would, you know, help me understand how they were organized. But in fact, the ship cargo lists are so basically disorganized. You know, I don't know how they knew what they were carrying, frankly, <laughs> that I decided that wasn't helpful. I mean, it was interesting to me that they weren't sort of saying, well, here in this special part of the ship, we're putting luxury goods. You know, actually, last summer, I had the opportunity, I was at Chatham, Massachusetts, and I was watching these fishing boats. They had this viewing platform, and they were calling off all this fish. It was dogfish, tons of it. And I am getting somewhere relevant here, just <laughs> gross, gross fish. And the, at a certain point, the captain of the, the fishing boat comes out with a little box, and in it are, you know, two precious fish, I don't remember what they were, but they weren't the run-of-the-mill dogfish. And I had sort of been hoping I was going to find something like that in the cargo books. Oh, and here's the special things, including Damascene bronze. And I never found anything that indicated to me that I could map out the values of these things in cargo documents. However, I didn't look at letters. So I, mean, I think that could be, that has a different kind of voice to it that might really be helpful. I mean, the, the cargo documents are all about bulk. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly. And the sort of stuff that you're looking at, um, whether it's letters that travel or luxury goods or plants, those don't appear in, in the insurance contracts or in the uh, port records mm -hmm. because they don't, they don't rate in terms of volume or value. Right. No, that's, and so that would be another way to find them then. Right. Yeah. In fact, they may be more prominent in the letters. So thank you. Great. Alessandra? Yeah. I, I found very interesting your idea of visual comparison as a mercantile practice, so mm -hmm. it's a little bit of follow-up mm -hmm. on Twitter. So my question is, how does the ponente complicate your story? And if there are, in fact, objects that are compared and named and worded in a way that, I mean, uh, Leah Markey has worked mm -hmm. on this idea of, of the Indiana, no? So mm -hmm. is there something similar with the turquesque or, or your so terms? the sort of dis the displacement of the terms. Yeah, I mean, how yeah. objects coming from the other side, the other of the side. Water are also part of this mobility language. Well, I, I haven't I haven't thought about that. I'll be honest with you. I haven't thought about the other side of the world as a point of comparison. The Venice is absolutely absolutely, um, and whether there's different language, uh, I don't know. I would. Yeah, yeah your idea of, uh, of visual comparison, mm -hmm. of how this translates into a language mm -hmm. where, in fact, mm -hmm. these terms and these objects are completely right. no. named every time. Yeah, right. thank you for giving me a chance to say a few words about that. I really skimmed over that part of the paper, which I hope you will uh, be able to access soon. Um, I, I, it is not my observation. Um, people like Evelyn Welsh have talked about the marketplace in Venice and noted that there are these comparison days, which were all about comparison. And I argue that we need to see this on sort of a spectrum of comparison and not an either or, it's east or west or Venetian. So that's how I would begin to think about it. What are the sort of nuances of those mm -hmm. distinctions yeah. and that span of distance as opposed to the separation? What would be interesting to know is are they talked about very differently or is there an overlap of, of language? Uh, so thank you.
Um, okay, one last question. Who, who is? Hi, um, thank you very much for your talk. It was very illuminating um, for uh, helpful um, for thinking about um, these things. I think I, I had a similar experience of what she said earlier, of, like I've been trying to articulate <laughs> some of what you gave me tools to articulate, so thank you. Um, <laughs> And um, what I find interesting is that you say that a lot of this theory has to do with human migrations, mm -hmm. and then you're um, sort of applying it to objects, and, um, and you had some interesting suggestions about how art museums could collaborate or learn from different types of museums, and it just occurs to me that um, oftentimes, you know, uh, museum goers, uh, you know, the general public, what they might inherently be interested in is not necessarily the objects in themselves, but the story that gets told about the objects, and that's what you're trying to hmm. get at is like, you know, how can we tell this story in a different way? And so my question is, how do you see the relationship between these theories of human migration and these people who might be spine wranglers or whatever, <laughs> um, and um, the objects themselves? Like, how, how do we kind of, how do you see those as fitting together, especially in um, potentially in the in the setting of a museum mm -hmm. exhibition. Well, I think they're kind of. Thank you. It's a good question, and um, yeah, I, and uh, various sorts of responses to it. But um, I think that attaching. Well, one response I have is I was talking to someone at uh, one of the Smithsonian museums, and she worried that museums would begin to do too much navel gazing. And I think mm -hmm. you know there is a danger that yeah. we're really interested in museums and what they do, but at what point does that just turn people off? I mean, European mm -hmm. museums are doing a lot more kind of self-reflecting. Um, so I, I think we, museum people who aren't just thinking about it in the abstract need to be cautious. But I think binding things to people is a good way to do this. And this is why I, I pointed to the Kipling exhibition, because it does do that in the place of a person. The other example I can sort of think of, I don't know if any of you saw the, Pearl on the S Pearls on a String exhibition at the Walters Art Museum, which was about Islamic art, but really tried to, instead of talking about it, just a particular culture, the Mughals pinned the stories to an individual and then helped us see those relationships through an individual. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe that's a way of mm -hmm. humanizing the object stories, is if you can attach it to a thing to a person. In terms of theoretical um, relationships, that's something I I need to think about harder. How much? How much is it reasonable to apply, you know, James Clifford's notion of the contact zone, which is really about people yeah. encountering objects in museums, yeah. to a discussion of historical objects? Mm -hmm. So I, I think these theories can help us think more carefully about terms and categories. Um, but perhaps we need to be cautious in making direct analogies. Okay, well, speaking of mobility, some of us <laughs> have to go places um, for 130 classes, but I, if, the, if the quality of the questions is any indication of the, of the inspirational nature of your talk, I think that we've had both this afternoon, and thank you so much. I think many of us here look forward to continuing the conversation, either informally now or during the semester. And I have to show my last oh. slide, just in okay. case my email. In case <laughs> anyone okay. has follow-up thoughts for me, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, and but you're <laughs> here until? I'm here until the end of May. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you there we again, go. Elizabeth. Thank and you. Thanks,